good evening, everybody. I'm going to introduce from down here. My name is Creston Long. I'm the director of the Edward H. Nav Research Center for Delmarva History and Culture. I want to welcome all of you this evening. I also want to thank uh, Dean Martin Paraboom, Dean of the Fulton School of Liberal Arts, and Michael Lewis, the chair of the Environmental Studies Department. Both are co-sponsors of the event tonight. And I know many of you are environmental studies students. So thank you all for coming. Uh, our speaker tonight, we've been looking forward to this for a, for a long time. Kate Livy is a professional Chesapeake educator, writer, and historian. She is a native of the Eastern Shore who's always had a passion for the Chesapeake Bay, its culture, and the landscape. Until very recently, she was the Director of Education and the Associate Curator at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in St. Michael's, just about an hour north of here. And she currently serves as the, the new managing editor of the Chesapeake Bay Magazine. She is also adjunct faculty at Chestertown's Washington College, where she teaches courses about the Bay's environment, economy, and its culture. Livy has written about the Bay's history and traditions for publications, including Wooden, yeah, Wooden Boat, which is a periodical about wooden boats. Uh, she's also written for the Chesapeake Bay Journal and has consulted as a museum professional for the Smithsonian's Museums on Main Street Initiative. Her 2015 book, Chesapeake Bay Oysters, the Bay's Foundation and Future, and that's the subject of her talk this evening. It won the Maryland Historical Society's Marion Brewington Prize for Maritime History. So please welcome Kate Livy. Thank you, Creston, and thanks to all the students and faculty and community members who have come out tonight to uh, watch me nerd out on my favorite topic of all time, oysters. Um, so I've had a lot of people ask me why I chose to write a book on this topic. Um, and I didn't start out thinking I was going to write a book at all. Um, I was writing a blog, Beautiful Swimmers. Um, I was freelance writing. I loved writing about the Chesapeake Bay. I was so passionate about it. But oysters kind of just kept coming up. Um, Oysters are really this connection, I found, between the deepest parts of our Chesapeake past and our very um, contentious contemporary present. Oysters are this survival food that fed you know, Neolithic peoples throughout the Chesapeake Bay, but somehow they're also something that you open up the local newspaper and there's a debate. There's ongoing controversy over oysters even now. And what's amazing about that is that, you know, oysters are not attractive. You know, they're not attractive on the outside and they're definitely not pretty on the inside. But yet, we are really still very passionate about them as Chesapeake people. You know, you think about the species that people really want to conserve and generally that has a direct proportional relationship to how cute they are. You know, everybody wants to protect seals, but. Oysters don't even have a face, and we really care about how many oysters are in the Chesapeake Bay. And that's because just as oysters were a survival food, an element to our survival, they're an element to our Chesapeake environmental survival today. They're a connection between our culture, our environment, and our history. They're an, you know, an environmental Chesapeake architect, um, but they're also this uh, palette, this canvas, onto which we project our concerns about changing bay culture uh, and the changing Chesapeake environment. So what's not to dig into about that topic? Uh, this is a scene uh, from one of my favorite walks um, in Kent County where I live, um, where I was born and raised. Uh, my husband and I like to walk our dogs out on Eastern Neck Island, which is now a national wildlife refuge, and we'll walk through, you know, stands of salt meadow hay and loblolly pine um, until you get to this vista overlooking the Chester River, the mouth of the Chester River where it connects to the, the Chesapeake Bay. And as you look down, you're standing on this beach, and it's all oyster shells. And what this is, is it is a ghost of an environmental and a cultural past. It is a midden. A midden is a trash pit of you know, dis discarded leavings, um, in this case from Native Americans who would venture down to the water's edge in the wintertime 
to harvest oysters by hand, to slowly cook them over a fire, and to feast on them. And they were an incredibly important part of the diet for Native Americans in the Chesapeake. I mean, these were people who were had a semi-nomadic tradition. They had seasonal uh, hunting and gathering locations. And this would have been a wonderful spot to pick up oysters with your hands and to catch waterfowl. And this entire beach is made of oyster shells. So this is Native Americans over thousands of years seeking food out of the same location. And they represent, too, an environmental part of the history of the Chester River. If you go down to that spot today, you don't see any oysters. There aren't oysters to pick up by hand. There aren't oysters to harvest by dredge. There's nothing down there. But what was there would have been these oyster shoals that would have broken the top of the water at low tide. These were castles of marine benthic life where you had naked gobies and sea squirts and anemones and mussels and mud crabs hiding in the nooks and crannies of oysters that have grown one on top of another on top of another to create these you know, towering piles under the water. And then you've got big apex predators swimming around like rockfish. You know, elsewhere, they call rockfish striped bass, but we call them in the Chesapeake rockfish because watermen refer to these oyster shoals, these structures, as oyster rock. They're named after the place where watermen observed these apex predators feeding on the bounty of the bay that these oysters provided. And of course, to our modern consternation, they were also filtering the water. So this was a clear body of water too. It's still a very beautiful place, but it is nowhere near as environmentally complex as it once was or sustainable because it's missing one important element of the landscape, and that's the oysters. The oysters today that you can only read as sort of chalky scars from what used to be. Oysters remained a survival food as we go into the 17th century with colonization. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody coming to Jamestown, right? This is the 17th century. These are people that are coming from a pastoralized society or an urban society where, you know, if you were the cobbler's son, then you were going to be a cobbler and your grandfather had been a cobbler. This is not a land of opportunity. This is a place where um, our, uh, land sense didn't really exist. Even if you were a farmer or you worked in sort of an agricultural type of position, you didn't know how to live off the land. These are not pioneers. We have this American, very beloved American archetype that all of our forebearers that showed up here on the shores were ready to stalk a deer and take him down and you know, make a delicious venison steak for dinner and a new pair of moccasins for, to wear the next day. I mean, unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth with the early colonists that arrived. They weren't prepared. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to fish. And they certainly didn't know where the hell they were when they looked around at the local environment. They were surrounded by the kind of savage wilderness that to them would have been akin to putting somebody down on Mars. They didn't know what they were looking at. I mean, there are descriptions from the 17th century of the, the furry beast with the worm tail that feigns sleep when I approach. And they're talking about a possum, but they don't know what they, they don't know if they can eat it. They don't know why it's sleeping. They have no idea. But what they do know is oysters. By the time the Jamestown settlers arrived in the Chesapeake, they were already the recipients of a long and deep European oyster eating and rearing tradition. The Romans had expanded into Britain. Um, and bringing with them their, you know, rapacious uh, appetite for oysters. You know, they, there's even a, there's a, 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 um, an account written, you know, a, a very sad Briton who, or a Roman who's in Britain and hates it. You know, it's cold, it's wet. He says, but uh, the poor Britons, but at least they produce an oyster. You know, they, the Romans taught the Britons how to grow oysters the way they had in Rome. Um, oysters were exported back. And so going forward, it meant that oysters were always a part of the tradition in Europe in this time period, but specifically in England. By the time that the Jamestown settlers arrived in the 17th century, um, Shakespeare had already written the immortal words, the world is mine oyster that I with a sword shall open. So they arrive in the Chesapeake, and they look down into the clear water, and what do they see? 
but piles and piles of living survival down there on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. And the crazy thing about oysters, the beautiful thing about oysters, right, is you, if you think about you know, quick, efficient protein, which is what so many of our uh, predecessors were, were consumed by, thinking about all the time, how am I going to get food? Oysters are the perfect example. These oysters were as big as the sole of my shoe. These oysters were static. They also didn't run away. So they're like the perfect meal, you know? And they remained incredibly important throughout the 17th century as, as time moves forward. And I took this image at Jamestown um, in one of the archeological sites, and they found thousands and thousands and thousands of oyster shells. They've got trash cans full of them because the oysters were at the top level of the archeological pits. What they represented was the last wave of colonists who heard what had happened in Jamestown, mainly nothing good and a lot of cannibalism. And so the last wave of settlers came in vessels loaded down with oyster shoals from further down the James River. That was the survival food for Jamestown. And that tradition would continue throughout the 17th into the 18th century as we see the proliferation of tobacco culture throughout the Chesapeake Bay. These are people who are spending their time. They're not farming food for their own consumption. So having the reliance on quick, easy protein right there in a river by your waterfront you know, estate and acreage where you're farming tobacco was so incredibly important. I actually have, I'm not gonna do a lot of reading from the book tonight, um, but I do have one passage that I wanted to read because um, I'm sure many of you know this, but there are, there are many joys of research and one of them is you know, falling down a wormhole and finding some awesome historical uh, document that reminds you that we are not too different from people in the past. Court records from Maryland in March 15, 1663, suggest the extreme importance of oysters as a survival food for early colonists. A sailor named Tobias Duncan arrived at the tobacco plantation of William Bromall in 1662 to pick up some tobacco assisted by a fellow sailor. In the plantation's water access along a cove, a canoe had been stowed full of oysters. Duncan helped himself to a few before being confronted by the furious plantation owner, who in the words of the other sailor, railed at us, asking of us, what did we do there? The sailor replied that we were eating a few oysters, telling him withal he need not be so angry for eating a few oysters, for they cost him nothing. Bromall was not mollified. He argued with the sailors, for they cost him his labor. He had been all day in the getting of them. Even when the sailors assured him they would pay for the oysters they had eaten, Bromall was so irate, he swore at the two men, damn me, you dogs, I will kill you if there be no more sea dogs in the world. He then fired his gun among the sailors, wounding several, and set his dogs on the rest. Bromall's actions, teetering on the edge of insanity, indicate the value of a boat full of oysters, free but also priceless. The thin white line between starvation and survival for Chesapeake planters they were worth fighting for. I don't know about you, but I think swearing has gotten a lot more enjoyable in the last 300 years. One of the interesting stories that I explored during the research um, of my book was the African-American story. And of course, that's also a 17th century colonial story, but it's a very different one than the one that the white planters would have experienced. One of the things that I discovered, um, and I think it's, it's known among many historical circles, is that you know, the, the ways that the Africans and later African-American populations were assimilated to the environment was in a much deeper, um, much more intimate way than the people that owned them. And that's simply because if you were enslaved on a Chesapeake plantation, more likely than not, if you were black, you were the person going out to harvest oysters. You were going out at night to forage. You had a much more, um, you know, desperate, in some cases, connection with the land than the people that owned you. And what you saw frequently is that if they did have uh, slave labor on these tobacco plantations, often slaves were given a canoe, they were sent out, and they were given the responsibility of fishing for the household. 
Um, the people that were coming to, the, the enslaved peoples that were coming to the Chesapeake in this time period are from West Africa, um, full of riverside communities um, where there is a native oyster and uh, fishing traditions in log canoes is something that you see in that society as well. So these were people that were mariners. They were used to fishing and used to working on the water. And in a lot of ways, this provided a, sort of a pinhole of freedom for a lot of these enslaved people in this time period. Um, they were given the responsibility, but also the benefit of going out on these small skiffs and learning the rivers. They harvested oysters and other seafood that could be sold just a little extra or bartered for something that you needed or something that you wanted. Um, they also learned the waterways at night, a real benefit when it came to escaping and running away. And one of the things I saw over and over in so many of these runaway slave advertisements in the 17th and especially in the 18th century was often slaves were running away in canoes, canoes that they obviously knew how to use very capably. So when I think about this idea of waterman, which really is a very 20th century term, the idea is that you are someone who fishes in every season, right? You, you're working the water in every season. I would say, without a doubt, it's accurate that the first watermen in the Chesapeake were Africans and African Americans. Um, and again, this particular image of um, uh, African American men tonging on the York River is one of my favorites. Um, even as we progress into the 19th century, um, African Americans continue to use small watercraft because they can build it themselves. They don't have to rely on anyone else. They don't have to get a captain's license and they can have their freedom. Um, they had their freedom on the water um, in a little bit more um, than many of their other contemporaries, but even after um, emancipation, we see them still working um, in groups like this, um, in small craft like this, tonging for oysters just like this. So what changed? We had a slow local harvest throughout the 18th and the early part of the 19th century. But that had a lot to do with the fact that we had a slow local population. In the 19th century and the 18th century, there were large cities just not in the Chesapeake. Manhattan, um, New York City, Boston, there were large urban centers, people who were also European immigrants, um, just like the Chesapeake, people who were used to an oyster culture, who associated oysters with a familiar taste of home. Um, but these large urban populations, they were the places that developed techniques like dredging first. There were a lot of people hungry for oysters. They needed bigger boats and bigger tools to go out and harvest all of them. The problem is the Chesapeake is the biggest natural shellfish tributary on the East Coast. And anywhere points farther north, even if they had large populations of oysters, their population of hungry oyster eaters was even bigger. So you start seeing really the first regulations regarding oyster harvesting in New England in the 17th century, which I think is actually kind of incredible. Um, it shows that already they're over harvesting and recognizing that they need to pull back. By the 19th century, the very beginning of the 19th century, what you see are oyster ventures in New Haven. Um, you know, I've been told, I'm a native Eastern Shore woman myself, but I'm told that people from the North are very interested in money. They're very good business people. So these very good business people decided that they were going to start exploring oyster bodies further south. They heard there were great oysters in New Jersey, so they hit up those oysters. They heard there were great oysters in Delaware Bay. They show up in Delaware Bay. And before you know it, it's right around 1810 or so, and they arrive in the Chesapeake. Um, they've got these big schooners. They've got these big dredges, things that Virginians had never seen before. And Virginians then, as now, disliked outsiders, foreigners. And so the first regulations in the Chesapeake Bay regarding the oyster industry are to keep out northerners. So that the first regulations basically say that unless you live in Virginia, you can't fish here. So the New Englanders figure, well, God closes a door, he opens a window, I'm just gonna sail on right straight through Virginia north into Maryland and harvest their oysters. So then subsequently, Maryland's first regulations are against these New England captains coming down. Well, now the New Englanders are really in a pickle. What are they going to do? Well, 
They decide if you have to be a Maryland resident to harvest Maryland oysters, it's time to move to Baltimore. And it just so happens that right around this time period, the 1820s and the 1830s, what you see is some amazing transformations of Baltimore, which had been a backwater community. I mean, in the 18th century, there's a discussion. Should the big city in Maryland be Joppa Town or Baltimore Town? They were actually deliberating over where, where to make the population center because both places were still relatively small. They ended up picking Baltimore, and Baltimore becomes this growing, slowly growing hub. But it's really two things that change, that transform the industry. So we've got the schooners and the dredges from the, uh, from the New England captains, but they're illegal. You can't use them yet. They're still distrusted by locals. What happens in Baltimore? The B&O Railroad, right? The Industrial Revolution that that represented. The other thing that happened is these New England interests introduced a new technology to the Chesapeake that we had never seen before, food preservation, canning. So today, you know, you look at a can of peaches, it doesn't look like much. But in the 19th century, you were literally canning sunshine. It was summertime in a can. It was amazing. The idea that you could take perishable goods, seal them up, and they would stay good to eat for a long time was incredible. Up until that time period, the only major commercial harvest in the Chesapeake had been shad, a fish that could be salted, packed, and shipped. The, they had tried to preserve oysters by pickling them, but that is just about as disgusting as it sounds. Although George Washington liked them a lot. Um, but what you see, you know, as a result of the B&O Railroad, of canning, and of this technology is basically they spark the explosion of the oyster boom. Baltimore goes from a backwater to a place where the inner harbor starts becoming ringed with packing houses. Um, and the major catalyst, the thing that really pushes it over the brink, is the end of the Civil War. So the Civil War saw the expansion of the railroad systems for, for uh, transporting soldiers and transporting ammunition and food. Um, and so now you've got this easy network to transport goods and services along. You've got canning, and you've got this, after 1865, legal dredging harvest. And it was the Wild West. You had literally entire towns being created out of marsh. Crisfield, Maryland did not exist before this time period, and it was the town that oysters built. There are descriptions of Crisfield in the 19th century where they liken it to a Saloony Wild West community, a shabby little Venice built on oyster shells. The idea was that there were boats coming in laden with oyster shells. You threw up a packing house, you shucked those oysters into cans, put them on trains, and sent them out to feed the nation with a delicacy that they had only known when they lived in the East. And also at this time period, you have westward expansion. People are headed out. They're headed out into the countryside. And so what they're taking with them is those East Coast traditions, taking them into the Midwest. So oysters were a reminder, a taste of home. And despite the fact that they look pretty unappealing when they're canned, people could not get enough of them. So it was an industry that go, sparks overnight. You take something that had been local, slow, you harvest it as much as you could catch in a day and sell in a day to something that was feeding this incredible economy of the 19th century. And by the end of the, the 1880s, what you saw is almost 25% of Maryland's population was somehow involved or reliant upon this industry. Whether they were out there harvesting in the Chesapeake, whether they were out there um, packing oysters or shipping oysters. What you saw too was the emancipation of the African American population meant that a lot of black people on the Eastern Shore went to work in packing houses. They'd pack oysters in the wintertime and they'd pack produce in the summertime. In uh, Baltimore, you saw immigrant labor being pressed into service in, in horrible conditions um, in a lot of these huge Baltimore packing houses. And out on the Chesapeake, you'd see scenes like this. Um, bug eyes um, and pungies, and later on skipjacks, harvesting as many oysters as possible. Initially, there was very little regulation because we thought oysters would just be there forever. There's this mentality that some of you environmental science students might have heard before, this idea that manifest destiny as it applies to you know, the environment. This idea that 
God put these passenger pigeons, buffalo, oysters there for you, and God would, you're a good Christian, God would continue to provide. Well, unfortunately, we recognize that that's not a really good environmental management strategy today. But at this time period, they saw big houses, they saw fancy dinners, they saw pretty dresses for their wives, they saw opportunity in the oyster shoals of the Chesapeake Bay. And as beautiful as that sounds, it was also lawless. It was a full out scramble for as many oysters you, as you could possibly get. The two regulations that existed after the oyster dredges were legalized in 1865 were pretty simple. Shallow waters known as county waters were for tongers. Deep waters were for dredgers and those were known as state waters. You just had to stay within your respective boundaries. Tongers had no problem doing that. It was the dredgers who were tempted going out over these shallow waters so full of oysters, just drop an oyster dredge, or better yet, come back at night when nobody's going to see what you're doing and drop a dredge or two. The tongers armed themselves against the dredgers, right? It's after the Civil War. Everybody's got a gun. The dredgers armed themselves against the tongers and the very nascent state fishery force that had been established just two years after 1865 didn't know what to do. So this is a scene of one of those Baltimore packing houses. And one of the things that I just want to point out here, um, you know, this is all immigrant labor. These women are not wearing mob caps because it's a fashion uh, accessory. They're wearing these mob caps because long hair gets caught in industrial equipment and scalps you. Um, these were horrible places to work. On the eastern shore, you saw less abuses, and that's because in small communities with a limited labor pool, you couldn't afford to kill your workers and bury the bodies out back. But in Baltimore, unfortunately, there were a lot of wrongs you could do and just continue to get more laborers coming in from Germany, from Ireland, pouring into the city in the 19th century. And this is what Baltimore's Inner Harbor looked like. If you've ever been there on a class field trip, you see the aquarium and the science center, and to my eye, it looks sterile, something's missing. It is this gritty, beating heart in the middle of Baltimore. It was never meant to be scenic. It was meant to be the highway. And what you are looking at is essentially a truck stop on the highway of Baltimore in the 19th century. We are looking at schooners lined up four deep, groaning under the weight of oyster shells. This was an incredibly important industry, not just to Baltimore, but throughout the state. And think about what all that shucking produces, right? A lot of oyster shells, but fortunately we had a very efficient system set up where whatever you harvested, you know, those oyster shells would be ground up and put into fertilizer and chicken feed. If you go to the Baltimore Museum of Industry, you can see buttons that they made out of oyster shells. You know, we found a use for all that material, which would later also come to haunt us. So I want to talk about this guy. Um, his name is Hunter Davidson, um, and I think he's got, I don't know, I, I don't mind saying I've always had a little crush on Hunter Davidson. Uh, he's like my historical boyfriend. Uh, so Hunter Davidson is the, uh, the head of that state fishery force, the fishery force that was supposed to stop people from shooting at each other over oysters, the state fishery force that was supposed to, to quell what started to be called the oyster wars by the major newspapers that were covering the conflict at the time. So think about it. This is Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. Um, this is like the Us Weekly of the 19th century. It's mostly pictures. Um, they love celebrity photos. You know, they're just like us, separated at birth. Um, but what you see in this particular instance is one of those gun battles. Um, and they had a name for the poaching and the poachers that you'd see on these Chesapeake tributaries. They call them oyster pirates, right? That sells. And they didn't call these, you know, skirmishes the oyster wars held by oyster pirates in the Chesapeake Bay, which is unfortunately kind of still the way we, we talk about this. So Hunter Davidson was, was assigned the job, the unenviable position um, of taking his fantastic uh, sideburns and trying to quell what was happening on the Chesapeake in this time period. He had one boat. He had 
one howitzer on one boat. So he ended up going back to the state assembly and basically begging them for reinforcements, which he was given. And not a moment too soon, because what you saw in the 1870s were basically all-out brawls, where um, skipjack captains would work together in teams to harvest illegally. They might station someone out at the mouth of a river who would raise a lamp up if they saw the state fishery force coming, but otherwise, if the op you know, the uh, conditions were right, you'd go out and harvest as many as you possibly could and get them back into port. Um, there were examples of these, um, these sort of gangs of armed poachers um, taking uh, tongers and stripping them naked and sending them back into the night to tell anybody else that was working on the river in a small skiff that this is our territory. But things really got bad when one group of these poachers on the Chester River opened fire on a passenger steamer that was headed full of women and children back up to Chestertown, Maryland, thinking mistakenly that it was the state fishery force. So in response, the state fishery force dropped the hammer. They sent in the McLean, which is still at the dock at the Baltimore Museum of Industry today. You can go and see it. They sent the McLean up. And what the McLean saw when it was confronted by a wall of these poachers, they had um, metal on the front of their boats to form this battalion. You know, they've got rifles sticking out all over the place. So the McLean approaches, gets closer and closer, and they're not backing down. So what does the McLean do? All you know, motors going, it just powers right ahead, right through the middle of all the boats, and all hell breaks loose. You've got boats sinking, you've got sailors crawling on the bows of their of the McLean saying, you know, we're we'll stop oystering. I never want to do this again. You've got people sort of scarpering off upriver. And it's a victory for the McLean, except until they look into the holds of some of these skipjacks. And what do they find? Impressed crew from Baltimore, Germans, who had been kidnapped and put into the holds of these ships so that they could use them as slave labor. And everyone had drowned. And that happened over and over and over again throughout the Chesapeake Bay. People's bodies would wash up on Smith Island blue and chained together, people that had been pushed overboard. And generally, you saw this kind of behavior not from captains along the eastern shore, but you really saw them from captains in Baltimore because there, the population was so much larger that human life was dispensable. And there were some court cases that were taken up in the 19th century, but unfortunately, no one, not even Hunter Davidson, would be able to slow this controversy, this, uh, you know, the free-for-all that was taking place in the 19th century until the populations, unsurprisingly, started to decline. So there's a peak, there's a, a time period between 1865 and 1880, you reach the peak of the oyster harvest. And after that, everything since that time has been declined. Now, if you were living in the Chesapeake in this time period and you, know, you were one of the 25% of the Maryland population that relied on this as your livelihood, this was terrible news. So for the first time, the state of Maryland decides to look to science. They need more oysters and they don't know how to get them. So they rely on this guy, William K. Brooks, um, who I always like to say, you know how they say you are what you eat? I feel like he's got like kind of an oyster thing going on, like right here, a little right here, you know. So William K. Brooks, oyster lover, obviously, um, is a newly minted researcher at the Johns Hopkins University. And he had studied um, mussels and mussel reproduction, but he was basically the only person that knew how shellfish did it. And they needed a guy to understand how could they make oysters do it. They really didn't know. So the state of Maryland sends, um, sends W.K. Brooks down to Crisfield, Maryland with a barge and a bunch of students and basically they study oyster sex for a summer. They're just watching to see how they can get them in the mood, what's the, what's the technique, what's the deal, and what Brooks discovers is really this incredible eureka moment. He realizes that unlike the European oysters, Crassostria virginica reproduces externally. I know, you're not impressed. And neither was the public. 
Nobody got it. It didn't sink in at all. In fact, there was a headline, you know, Brooks goes to the newspapers with this. He's like, I figured it out. They reproduce externally. And the headline in the Baltimore said read, Maryland oyster refuses to be tied to its mother's apron strings. So, you know, he's defeated. This is important because what he's discovered is that if they reproduce outside of their body, it's really easy to make a lot more of them. You get two oysters in warm enough water and they start, you know, reproducing and you can have millions of little spat larvae floating around in your tank. It could be so easy to make more oysters is what he realized. He can fix this problem. But it, how is he going to get the message out there? That's his biggest issue. No one cares. No one cares about his gross oyster study. They're just really not into it at all. So what he decides is he, he can't take this to Joe Public. He needs to take this message to another group of constituents, to educated people, people with extra money, people with power, people who sit at home on the weekends, paging through their book of pressed ferns and their slippers, somebody with a big etage full of fossils from Clover Cliffs, or, or somebody who loves to just take those beautiful butterflies and pin them right to a board. These are your armchair scientists. And in the 19th century, they were also real scientists. There wasn't an idea that you had to have a PhD to, to move the needle forward on the, you know, the annals, the halls of science. You could do it at home in the comfort of your Victorian surroundings. Those are the people that he needs to influence. So William K. Brooks sits down and he spends a year writing a book. And he writes this book and he fills it full of his passionate ideas. You know, the oysters can be reproduced just like in France and in Rome. We can, we can grow oysters on the bottom. I'm going to draw these beautiful images of an oyster's anatomy so anybody can understand how this works. Oyster, you know, we can do the same things as the French and the Romans. We can grow oysters for the industry. So he publishes this book, and what do you think happens? Nothing, right? It totally works. He totally sells it. William K. Brooks's book is so influential that a lawyer in, uh, in Annapolis, a, law a lawmaker in this time period, actually drafts a bill. And it passes to get Maryland to survey the bottom of the bay and to start looking into, unbelievably, aquaculture. Aquaculture in the very beginning of the 20th century. We think aquaculture is something new, right? We talk about it like it's new, but it's old. And in this time period, we were moving towards that. Virginia heard about what Maryland was doing and was like, that's a great idea. We're going to do it too. We're going to survey our bottom just like Maryland, and we're going to go with oyster leasing. Great. They move forward, and they double down. Almost immediately, you start seeing these oyster leases flourishing in Virginia. Marylanders especially what we call the oyster lobby or the oyster vote, which would have been packing houses and watermen and railroads and any, you know, can makers, anybody who was involved in this industry, they all hate this idea. They want more oysters so that they can continue to do business as normal. They don't want new technology. They don't want you know, different boats. They don't want different gear. They want just more of what we had before, please. They hate this idea. And what they're afraid is might happen, and, and it's happened in other places along the East Coast, was our oyster population is going to decline. We're going to start growing oysters, and corporations are going to come in and privatize the Bay's bottom, which is Remarkable, it's like, is there an echo? It sounds, that is very much the argument you see when you open the newspaper today. It's still very much a concern. So what happens after the Hayman Act is passed is that basically within two years, the entire law is gutted. And what you see is that Maryland instead decides what they will do instead of farming oysters or oyster leasing is that they are going to double down on archaic technology. Instead, they are going to stick with skipjacks and dredges, despite the fact that there were steam engines and motorboats in this time period. And Virginia, on the other hand, goes with oyster leasing. So 
it's really the, the, what sets up this big, deep divide between Maryland and Virginia in terms of their oyster policy. Maryland goes with sort of the slow harvest approach with regulations. That's really where Maryland's you know, tightening, tightening, tightening of reg regulations get started is in this time period as they're trying to control the oyster harvest, which has already declined. And Virginia just moves right on ahead with oyster leasings. So I do want to correct a popular misconception that I think is held sort of widely by the public if they think about oysters at all, which is that watermen are responsible for the demise of the oyster population. Um, that is just not true. What happens in the 20th century is that we actually see a relatively stable harvesting period between the 1920s and the 1960s, and that's because of diversification. Watermen between the 1920s and the 60s now have the benefit of not just canning, but refrigeration. And that means for the first time, they can pack and ship another Chesapeake delicacy that would come to be a very important harvest, crabs, right? You can harvest crabs, you can harvest crabs in the summertime, you can harvest um, oysters in the wintertime, you can harvest fish on either side. So that is really where the modern concept of a waterman begins, is that 20th century year-round harvest that's now available because of preservation technology. Now, in that time period, that takes the pressure off of the oysters to be the main mainstay, the most important mainstay of the Chesapeake economies, the Chesapeake maritime economy. So what we see is that the harvest kind of levels out. You see, you know, rises and falls, but nothing too dramatic. What happened? We, as people, as humans, um, really love to play God, but we are terrible at playing God. We are just horrible at it. I mean, we tend to really focus on maybe two years out and not too far beyond that, and we are very focused on our immediate problems. And what happened in the 20th century is that sort of godlike um, desire to manipulate the environment really comes to play in the Chesapeake's oyster populations. Um, we started a program which the watermen to this day still talk about as sort of the golden era that they recall of uh, the seed program. And what this was in the 20th century was that it was essentially um, large-scale cultivation. We would take oysters from one part of the bay that, where they were spatting off and doing really well, and we moved them to another part of the bay where they weren't doing so well. So, and you know, the state would help to fund these initiatives, and watermen were given the, the opportunity to move these oysters to the areas that you know they and the state designated, and it all worked, would have worked out pretty well if we hadn't started getting sloppy. So, you know, the oysters from Virginia are really great. Let's move them, let's move them a little further north. Or, you know, I've got a tributary in Maryland. Let's take, let's take them up there. All right, we'll, we'll kind of spread them around. I've heard, I've heard Louisiana's got some great oysters. You know, they're the same species and everything. Why don't we get some of those Louisiana oysters and bring them into the Chesapeake and see how they do? You know, Delaware, Delaware. They've got a great oyster in Delaware. Let's go get that oyster and let's bring it over and we'll, we'll experiment and we'll kind of spread those around. What we didn't know we were doing as we moved oysters around the bay with all the best of intentions was that we were also spreading non-native diseases. Um, in the case of the oysters coming from Louisiana, they were infected with a disease called dermo. Um, and in the case of the oysters from uh, Delaware Bay, they were infected probably by an Asian oyster, Crassostere gigas, with a disease called MSX, which stands for mononucleated sphere unknown. We didn't know what the hell they had, but we knew that it was all over the Chesapeake Bay very suddenly. What you see is between the 1970s and the 1990s, but particularly in the 80s to the 90s, there's this concentrated window of the oyster populations in the bay being absolutely devastated by these two diseases. And they hit the, Mar or the Virginia oysters food first. They're both salinity-loving diseases. So we continued, though, to, to move those diseased oysters up into the Maryland part of the bay, well, thinking, you know, it's fresh water. It's pretty fresh. It's, you know, much more brackish. The concentration of the salinity is much lower here. We won't get these oyster diseases. And we didn't until there was a drought because we're not God and we're really bad at being God. And what ended up happening is that watermen, people who are least likely to have 
insurance, least likely to have a bank account or a cushion of any kind to fall back on, go out in the winter time to harvest oysters, and they come back with boats, their dredges are just full of dead oysters, and for a lot of watermen, that was the end. And they become desperate. They're desperate to do anything to save this industry. It represents their livelihood. It represents our culture. It represents you know, so much about what's integral to being from the Chesapeake Bay. Being a waterman is a big part about working those oysters in the wintertime and relying on that income. And our culture, our boats, our skipjacks reflect that particular tradition. So by the 1990s, we're in a place where we say, all right, we're going to think about science for the second time. And we're now in a position in the, 19th, or the, the 1990s where things have changed, though, about our response to environmental crises. There's a push by the watermen in this time period to just go ahead and embrace a non-native species of oyster. And that's actually what most of the world has done. When an oyster population has declined because of banamia or other oyster diseases, they've just brought in an Asian oyster, Kraus austria gigas. The problem is, is that what we realized uh, after 1972 was that the Chesapeake isn't looking so good. The Chesapeake is looking pretty bad. We had an environmental consciousness awakening around Earth Day. And that environmental consciousness starts to show itself in the Chesapeake, in the establishment of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and a general recognition that the water quality in the Chesapeake through uh, over-nutrification, through sedimentation, was incredibly degraded. And in 1988, there was a study at Horn Point um, by a, a researcher there who discovered what oysters could do about that. Turns out oysters as filter feeders pretty much address both of those issues. They want to eat algae, they digest sedimentation, and they release it in the form of pseudo feces, and they, you know, they emit a stream of clean water out of their body. It's not a Brita filter, but it's, you know, the environmental equivalent of one. And what you see is that oysters became important because they represented Maybe not, not a silver bullet, but one effective strategy to respond to a declining Chesapeake Bay environment. It meant that we were really, uh, there, there was a whole group of new stakeholders, environmentalists, who were really unwilling to see the oyster population be replaced by non-native species because the oyster population could be part of the solution to saving the bay. So now we have... The, this much more diverse stakeholder population, and it changes the way that we respond to the next stage. Now, what happens in um, the late 1990s and into 2000 is that essentially the environmental community is powerful enough to have the process slowed down and that there's a study that's uh, undertaken at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And the, um, the main researcher there, Stan Allen, is tasked with exploring, is the Asian oyster even feasible? What will it do to our environment? Can we study this and get a sense before we introduce it to the bay? And so he creates a control. He's got a group of, you know, he, he gets watermen together. Watermen are part of the experiment. They're going to help him raise um, a group of sterile Asian oysters, because he doesn't want them reproducing and spreading all over the bay. And then they're going to also grow a group of sterile Crassostria virginicas, native oysters. And the idea, they're grown side by side, they're going to grow them out for a year, let's see how they do. So they're grown in floats just like this, um, and when he, the watermen pull them in, what do you think they find? The Asian oysters look pretty good. They look fat, they look plump, they're fought off the disease. But when they open up the cages full of the virginicas, they're alive. They should be dead. They should be dead because of disease. Why are they not dead? Well, it turns out that the fact that they are sterile makes them much more disease resistant. They are not immune, but they are not putting their energy into reproduction. They're putting it into growing bigger and fighting off disease. They have survived. So Stan Allen has his own William K. Brooks Eureka moment, but this time everybody's listening. He says, what I have created, these sterile oysters, they have three chromosomes, they're known as triploids. These could be the solution to our oyster issue, our oyster question here in the Chesapeake Bay. If you grow triploid oysters, 
it's a possibility to save the bay using our own native species. Now, Virginia, which had been into oyster leasing since the turn of the century, is well poised to jump on this, and they do. With, since that time period, since 2009, what you have seen is that Virginia's aquaculture industry has flourished, you know, has grown by 3,000%. And I'm not even very good with math, so I had to use one of those online calculators to figure it out, you know, what was the, the percentage. But it's a real number. That was the actual number. Maryland, on the other hand, there were whole counties where it was illegal to grow oysters. We didn't just dislike aquaculture. We had outlawed it. So what were we going to do? Well, in 2009, in December, Martin O'Malley got on a stage. And the thing to remember here is that oysters are politics, right? They're politics in the Chesapeake Bay. They always have been. They always will. He stood on a stage in front of a group of, you know, concerned citizens, and he said, I am going to introduce not only oyster aquaculture to the Maryland side of the Chesapeake Bay. I'm going to legalize it. I'm going to streamline it. I am also going to put aside 25% of Maryland's best bottom into sanctuaries. I am going to create regions where you can't harvest wild oysters at all, and instead we will attempt to recreate historic shoals so that we will see if oysters can recover on their own in an ideal environment. We're gonna build those shoals back up and we're gonna see if we can get there. Now this is unprecedented. When oyster populations have died around the world, we haven't tried to, to turn back the clock of time and recreate historic environments. We just move forward and introduce something else. But oysters were so important to the environmental strategy for addressing the Bay's issues that O'Malley moved forward with it. And for some people, they didn't see it as a, you know, a, a sailing into the future. They saw it more as steamrolling. The watermen saw 25% of the bottom of the bay that they had used to harvest oysters. Some of the best spots in the Chesapeake were just gone like that, gone overnight. And as you can imagine, their response was incredibly heated. And that's where a lot of this modern oyster controversy stems from. This, this sanctuaries, um, the public harvest of a, a, a fishery, a wild fishery that's still declining, and this movement towards people like my friend Scott who are growing oysters as entrepreneurs. Scott is an oyster farmer. There's a big difference between farming and hunting and gathering, which is what watermen do. Um, water, watermen are going out and fishing and finding what is there every day. Scott, on the other hand, knows exactly what he has. He's working the same cages, the same part of land. He had to invest a lot of money uh, in capital improvements, in a boat, in gear, in cages, in spat. He had to go through a three-year permitting process with the state of Maryland, where some of his most ardent objectors were people who own waterfront property and didn't want to look at oyster farms. He had to deal with the public, who was really concerned that uh, Scott's oyster farm would represent the beginning of the end for the watermen, that it would just proliferate and proliferate, and then there would be another lease and another lease and another lease and another lease, and where would the watermen ever work again? A lot of the concerns about oyster farms, about sanctuaries, they have to do with the polarization of our politics, but they also have to do with the things that we're afraid of. We're afraid we're going to lose traditions. We're afraid we're gonna lose the ability to go out and harvest and earn a day's honest wages. We're afraid we won't be able to afford to be a part of that industry anymore. We're afraid the bay is gone beyond all recovery. We're afraid. And we're afraid that you know, we won't be able to change with the times. But the Maryland's oyster aquaculture industry fortunately does continue to grow. And what you've seen is that more and more watermen are starting to try it for themselves. They're not doing it in cages like Scott. They're growing oysters on the bottom, uh, what we call extensive setting. Um, but the largest group of aquaculture holders in Maryland are not private businesses. They are watermen. Um, and watermen are getting in, involved in the industry. Now, the other thing you see is the change of this economy from a packing house structure. What you see is the diversification um, of the economy into 
the white tablecloth market, which is what Scott's oysters are grown for. Think about those fan, I don't know if any of you have been, but I love them. Those fancy oyster bars you go to where they've got the ice and they've got the oysters and there's like little sticks that tell you where the oysters came from and you watch them shuck the oyster and you're laying down two fifty an oyster or three dollars, no problem, and you're, you're like you know, smelling it and like tasting it like, you know, fine wine and like, oh, the marijuana, it's delicious. You know, I, I love those places. They're serving Scott's oysters. Watermen are growing their oysters on the bottom and they are selling them to packing houses. So they're still selling them to that traditional economy. But we're really looking at this diversification that reflects the diversification of harvesting techniques and aquaculture. But the controversy continues over uh, sanctuaries in Maryland. And now with the new governor in place, Larry Hogan, who I think is a pretty good guy, um, he has been, you know, has stated openly that he wants to end the war on watermen. He's very sympathetic to watermen's interests. Um, he feels that they're really aligned with this platform as a Republican. Um, and the watermen are happy about that. They're happy to feel like they have a voice. They're happy to feel like they're being represented um, in the state house. But what we're seeing now is a lot of those, that political tension is playing out in the sanctuaries. Um, we've turned away federal money um, that was supposed to go towards sanctuary restoration. The watermen at this point, I mean, there's a lot of controversy over opening up areas that have been sanctuary that we put millions of dollars worth of oysters into. They w would love to see those areas open back up to harvest. And of course, environmental groups like the Bay Foundation and River Keepers don't want to see that happen. Um, so again, it really represents on a small sort of microcosm uh, of our you know, national politics how you can get this sort of these two polarized group of people that both want the same thing, right? More oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. But what do you do with them? Are they there to help the bay? Or are they there to fill your pocket? You know, there's a disagreement. And those two stakeholder groups, they represent sort of this changing cultural dynamic around the Chesapeake Bay. Um, that we're looking at today. They don't know each other and they don't agree with each other and they don't like each other, even though they both want more oysters in the Chesapeake. So the last thing I'll say is that as controversial as the oyster topic is, as long a story as it is, I firmly believe that there has never been a better time to be an oyster consumer here in the Chesapeake. Every single oyster that is harvested is harvested for consumption. They're harvested for people to eat. That means as the consumer, you have the ultimate say over what direction our oyster industry goes in in the future. If you like watermen and you believe in supporting Maryland's traditions and culture, buy wild oysters, ask about it. We have no compunction about where did our steak come from? Where did our chicken come from? But we don't ask a lot of questions of our seafood and we should. If you think that aquaculture, sustainable fishing is the way forward, you support people like my friend Scott, you want to see these oyster farms do well, know the names of the farms and ask for them. Are these aquaculture oysters? You know, where do I buy your oysters? These are things, the basic questions that in the Chesapeake we never asked because we thought of them as all the same. But now that we've got these different options, as a consumer, you are just you know, assaulted with an array of too many choices when you go into some of these oyster bars, but they represent opportunities for the future. And so you, as the consumer, have to ask yourself, what do you believe and what do you want? And also, what are you hungry for? So at the end of the day, oysters are cool, and I hope you know a little bit more about the long, long, long story of the relationship between oysters, our environment, and the people here in the Chesapeake. Thanks. Oyster Farm is Orchard Point Oysters, and you can find them online and on Facebook and on Instagram, and probably Snapchat, but I don't really do that, so. Anybody else? Nothing you're dying to know? Yeah. Can you tell us more about the that's up there? Sure. So um, this is 200,000 bushels of oyster shells in Hampton, Virginia, um, and this is the typical amount of 
um, it's really actually not that uncommon, the typical pile of oyster shells, you would see um, co you know, collated together, and this would probably would have been used um, in oyster, you know, whether it was fertilizer or chicken feed, these are all oysters that are going to be used for something else. So this is part of that sort of 19th century and early 20th century oyster shell economy. Um, what ended up happening, though, is what we didn't realize later on is that oyster, baby oysters want to attach to other oysters in the form of oyster shells. Now we have so little oyster shell because we ground it up and we use it for roads and, you know, we fed it to chickens and whatnot. So this represents that other harvest that now we're really uh, sad about because there is so little oyster shell in the Chesapeake um, that we're actually bringing it in from places like Florida where we're digging up fossilized oyster shoals um, and bringing it up north. And that's actually sparked a lot of controversy amongst the watermen as well. We're putting it into these sanctuaries and it's sort of covered in fine silt and watermen are really concerned that you can fish for other stuff in a sanctuary, just not oysters. So what's it doing to the crabs and what's it doing to other bottom species? Um, you know, we, we put ourselves in quite the predicament here with the way that we have been using our monkey brains to so efficiently use oyster shells in every way possible. So that's a little bit behind that picture. Yeah. I guess what, uh, my question is, whenever they get the sterile oysters and put them in the bay, mm -hmm. what was the method behind that to just get rid of them? Wouldn't that be backtracking because if they couldn't reproduce, then why would you even put them in the water? Well, that is a good uh, environmental ethics question. So it's definitely something that I would encourage you to think about, right? Because the, the question is, I mean, so what they're using for restoration are naturally reproducing oysters, known as diploids. They have two chromosomes. But what they create when they make a sterile oyster is a triploid. That's three chromosomes. Um, the way that they create those now, originally they use chemicals. Now they don't do that anymore. They use um, a diploid and they use a tetraploid, a four chromosome oyster, and they breed them together to create the triploid. So the triploid oyster is what you see in aquaculture. What's used in oyster restoration is a naturally reproducing oyster, a diploid. Um, and those are created in labs like Horn Point Labs, um, and Virginia has other hatcheries as well. Yeah, I mean, they wanted to have, you know, the sterile oysters alongside the Asian oysters as a control. If all the Asian oysters died and all the uh, Virginicas died, that it might have been an outside influence. Maybe there was a freshwater pulse or something like that. They wanted to, you know, have those native oysters alongside the introduced species to see how they would do side by side. Any oyster questions you're just dying to ask? No? Well, thank you all very much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it.